thanks everyone for for joining us on on the inaugural uh, Nexus Communications uh, initiative that we've that we've got going. And uh, I want to thank all of you for taking time on your Friday afternoon for for joining us. Uh, Nexus was uh, inspired by the fact that that infectious disease threats have an impact not only on the biomedical and clinical communities, but on society as a whole. And that for us to tackle big problems like a pandemic or, or, or an outbreak or an epidemic, that we really need to understand that that impact that goes beyond the, the, the sort of scientific realm into our society, into our communities and our partners and our communities as well, and the, and the impacts that it has on it. And that there's opportunities for scholarship and partnership out there in order to tackle these problems in a more holistic way. And that's really at the center of, of Nexus. And, and, and this, these conversations are hopefully going to help bring that message um, to, uh, to the McMaster community and to our extended partners and communities outside of McMaster as well. So today we're really excited to, to do uh, our first one on masks, convoys, uh, clo closers and convoys. Um, and I want to begin, of, uh, of course, by uh, acknowledging the fact that um, at McMaster, we are on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations. Um, and we are within the lands that are protected by the dish with one spoon wampum agreement. For many thousands of years, the first people sought to gently or walk gently on this land, offering assistance to the, to the, first, uh, to the first European travelers and sharing their knowledge for survival in what was at times a very harsh climate. We seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land, one based on honor and deep respect. We maybe would be guided by the love and right action in this case, as we transform our personal and institutional relationships with our indigenous friends and neighbors. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to begin um, this, uh, this inaugural uh, communic um, Nexus Communications uh, with this acknowledgement. And I would like now to turn it over to one of the co-organizers of, uh, of the Nexus initiatives, Dr. Liz Alvarez, who's in our um, departments of, of health uh, evidence and impact here at the University, of uh, McMaster University. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you very much. Great, and um, yes, this is very exciting, our, our very first conversations. Um, the way we will run it is I will introduce all the speakers, um, and then we will ask a guiding question, um, and then they will each present for a short time, followed by a question and answer period. So if you do have questions, please make sure you're writing them either in the chat or in the Q&A, and we'll try to address both. Um, but we'll address those after everybody has spoken. And then we will end um, with a final thoughts from the panel and go from there. So we have a very exciting hour. Uh, let's get started. All right, so first I would like to introduce Farah Sucharan. Uh, Farah holds more than 15 years of experience in community work, specializing in optimizing social change through outreach and coordination. As a woman with multiple chronic illnesses, Farah's targets involve reducing inequalities for marginalized communities and promoting an inclusive society through speaking engagements and policy-related activities. She's been a member of the Ontario Council for International Cooperation, or OCIC, its Youth Policy Makers Hub since 2019 and now serves as a hub ally. In 2020 alone, she's helped to facilitate a webinar on basic income in Canada, organized a panel on women in politics, and spoken on ethical community engagement at OCIC's annual symposium. Farah is a former member of the Patient, Family, and Public Advisors Council at Health Quality Ontario, and she's currently uh, a master's student at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, specializing in poverty reduction policy with a focus on social inclusion and climate policy. Welcome, Farah. Um, Catherine Booth is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science and a member of the Center for Health Economics and Policy Analysis at McMaster. Katie studies health and social policy in mature welfare states with a focus on pharmaceutical policies. 
She's written on the development of public pharmaceutical insurance programs in Canada, Australia, and the UK, and changes to Canadian drug assessment and reimbursement policies. Her current research focuses on public and patient engagement in health policy and the role of ideas about evidence and legitimacy in health policy decisions, especially in periods of crisis. Welcome, Katie. David Earn was born and raised in Winnipeg, Canada, and completed his undergraduate in mathematics at the University of Toronto. He obtained his PhD from the University of Cambridge, England, where his research involved the application of mathematical methods to problems in theoretical astrophysics. During his postdoctoral years, he became interested in applying math to biological problems and soon shifted focus entirely to biology, especially the epidemiology of infectious diseases. David has been a professor in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at McMaster University since 2000, and is currently the Faculty of Science Research Chair in Mathematical Epidemiology. During the COVID-19 pandemic, he's been involved in using mathematical models to provide advice to policymakers. He's a member of the Ontario Science Advisory Table, Chair of the Ontario COVID-19 Modeling Consensus Table, and co-lead of the Canadian Network for Modeling Infectious Diseases. Welcome, David. Vish Baba is professor and former dean of the DeGroot School of Business at McMaster University. He was formerly the editor-in-chief of the Canadian Journal of Administrative Sciences. He's also president of the International Network of Business and Management Journal Editors. He has published extensively in major journals in the field of management and is currently on the editorial boards of a number of management journals, including the Journal of Organizational Behavior. Baba has taught various aspects of management in multiple countries, including France, China, Vietnam, and Trinidad. He's done management training in the Caribbean, China, Egypt, India, Kenya, and Vietnam. Baba teaches management theory and management development at the graduate level. Welcome, Vish, or Baba. <laughs> and we have Laurie Davis Hill, who is a NIDA, Wolf Clan, and member of the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. Lori has been employed with the Six Nations Health Services for the past 21 years, where she is now the director. Lori's focus since moving into the director role has been on building relationships, partnerships, and team approaches to create a holistic system that inspires people to achieve wellness for Six Nations community members. As part of her current role, Lori is responsible for maintaining multi-sector relationships at Six Nations and external at the regional, provincial, and federal levels. She's been involved in connecting with and initiating and advising several research projects with internal and external partners to address local health and wellness concerns, as well as contributing to Six Nations Research Ethics Committee. In 2021, Lori embarked on her journey to Doctorate of Social Sciences at Royal Rose University with a focus on Indigenous language as medicine. She has led the pandemic response as incident command for six nations of the Grand River since early 2020. Welcome, Lori. So with that, I am very honored to have a leading question for our panelists. And that is, from your perspective, what is something that is critical to consider in pandemic decision making? Sarah, I'll hand it over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this chance. So the past two years of the coronavirus pandemic has been a unique and game changing communal experience for everyone on Earth. However, is it truly communal? The experience has been quite different when you examine those that have social and economic supports and those that do not have such systems. Why is this? What are we to consider important for not if, but when we repeat the pandemic experience in the future? The answer lies largely in an adage that's been repeated in self-help books for years now, set systems, not goals. Although I do not wish to reduce my identity to nouns alone, they have shaped my pandemic experience entirely. I'm a chronically ill disabled woman of color and my survival depends on my systems. Taxpayer-funded healthcare has saved my life many times, but it is social and economic systems. Mine are made of my friends, family, and disability support programs. And these have allowed me to build any semblance of a life. Additionally, the peace of mind and safety 
that I received from government imposed health policies, such as mask mandates, have allowed myself and others in the disability community to experience the freedom that so many others seem to demand, the freedom to run errands, to exercise, and most importantly, to get healthcare. However, individual goals alone, be they a mask mandate or serve benefit, can never replace a system that does not take social inclusion into consideration. This is very true when it comes to Canada's pandemic system, because it has become a band-aid solution to growing national problems. Creating a basis of understanding of healthcare among the general public must be combined with a knowledge for why certain groups of people have different wants and needs, or we are going to repeat the convoy experience once more, as we see now. If you speak to those in the disability community, especially those whose survival depend on their own support systems, you'll learn one thing, disability is revolutionizing. It is revolutionizing because upon becoming disabled, you quickly realize that the social service system in Canada is inadequate and that your benefits are dependent upon an election cycle and that even in a pandemic, the government may not help you enough, but may leave you to want the medical assistance and dying act as an option instead. Yet when you're able to reach out to other disabled people and their allies, they'll find a community of people fighting for low cost housing, higher ODSP rates, and most importantly, a sense of community. For those against mask and vaccine mandates, perhaps it was a different moment in their lives when they became revolutionized. One in which they realized they had much less power than they initially thought much like the newly disabled. The differences lie in the expression of community and power that are created as solutions. For the disabled, they often relate more to inclusion, camaraderie, and social supports required to live. While for anti-vaxxers, the sense of purpose is often more exclusionary. If the government had long-standing laws and regulations meant to provide all of us with the supports we need to survive, would this fight for power be occurring as much? In her recently published book, Freedom to Think, The Long Struggle to Liberate Our Minds, author Susie Allegre notes that human rights law is ethics with teeth and there is no substitute for regulation. The government hasn't used its full strength to provide for, protect and listen to Canadians, but human rights can only thrive in a socially inclusive society where everyone's voice holds power. Continue to implement mandates and protect the most marginalized but also build educational, vocational, and housing policies for all. Allow for inclusive, anti-racist, anti-ableist educational policies, which diversify lessons from kindergarten. To paraphrase the great disabled writer, Leo Lakshmi Piepsa Samarasinghe, it is care work and collective access in our political and community arenas that is needed. And that's what will help us in the next pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Um, Katie? Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad to be here with this um, really fantastic group of um, uh, speakers and thinkers. Um, so my answer to, to the question um, that Liz posed for us to start out is, that um, we really, when we're uh, considering pandemic decision-making, I think it's critical to consider how we communicate about evidence when making pandemic decisions and also justifying those decisions. It's necessary for policymakers to be transparent and precise when communicating about the role evidence plays in their decisions, because this helps build or maintain public trust and legitimacy. Um, I think this is relevant to a whole range of pandemic decisions, but um, my collaborators and I have recently been focused specifically on the ways evidence about risk is communicated as part of school closure decisions. So, um, so that's what I wanna spend my time talking about. So um, my co-authors and I, uh, which includes our moderator, Liz Alvarez, um, and also Nicole Fiorio, Danielle Just, and Adrian Davidson, um, are interested in places where it appears that evidence and policy um, choices are not necessarily aligned. 
I think this is a top of mind issue for a lot of us now as um, mask mandates are, are lifted in many settings, including schools, isolation periods are shortened um, and the types of publicly available data and the frequency of public briefings about the pandemic are reduced. So our team looked at uh, official briefings related to schools in Ontario and Alberta during wave three of the pandemic. So last spring, 2021. Uh, and briefings in both provinces at this time were you know, full of references to the evidence. And I'll, I'll actually use scare quotes there because it's often not clear what evidence is, is being referenced. Um, However, there was a, a focus at this time on case counts as, as a primary indicator of risk. So we ask whether provincial decisions about school closures and reopenings can be explained by, by different levels of risk. Ontario, uh, you might remember, closed schools much earlier and for much longer than Alberta did in spring 2021. And, and so in trying to understand these different decisions, we asked first, was this because the two provinces were experiencing you know, significantly different pandemics? Um, and I think the answer is no. Uh, we actually find that key indicators about the severity of the pandemic um, at this time, uh, the key publicly available indicator was case counts were actually slightly worse in Alberta than in Ontario at the time when Alberta was reopening schools in May 2021 and Ontario was taking the decision to keep schools closed until the end of the academic year. So what we have here is um, a mismatch between the most publicly available evidence about risk, the type of evidence that is um, most present in, in public discourse, about risk at the time and the policy decisions about school. Um, so this is, you know, this is our, our first cut at this data. It's preliminary research, but the initial takeaway um, is that if policymakers don't engage with the complexity of the relationship between evidence and policy, there's a risk of harming public confidence and trust in, in the decisions. Um, this may be particularly the case uh, as pandemic weary citizens, so all of us um, make our own comparisons and are forced to draw our own conclusions about evidence for difficult policy choices um, and, and individual behavior. Um, so I'll leave it, leave it there and uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Katie. David? If you'll go next, uh, from your perspective, what is something that is critical to consider in pandemic decision making? Uh, thanks, Liz. So uh, again, I'm also very happy to be participating in this panel with this uh, with this group. And um, from my perspective as a as a mathematical modeler, uh, I guess I would say that good decisions require good data, and uh, I think that's true, you know, from all, it can mean qualitative data uh, for, for depending on the type of uh, research you do. For me, it's very quantitative. Um, and the key type of data that's important is surveillance data, cases, hospitalizations, deaths, appearance of new variants, and so on. So I think information about what's going on allows us to calibrate models well to uh, uh, to the, the current situation and then make projections that are more reliable. So I'm just going to illustrate that uh, with a couple of slides based on my experience um, through the science advisory table in Ontario. And I'm going to begin just by showing you uh, what's probably um, the best example of us doing well at making projections, which occurred uh, in February of 2021. So just over a year ago. So at that time, um, we were, I guess, just at uh, what appeared to be the end of the, the second wave. These heavy dots are the observed numbers of reported cases each day. 
and we were making a forecast to be submitted to the science table on this date. And uh, I'm putting, I'm treating modeling as a black box, but we, we, we fit a, uh, a model that, that uh, captures transmission and movement into hospitals and all sorts of things going on. And the, the calibrated model uh, yields this heavy red curve as the best fit to the data. And you can see that it goes right through and there's uncertainty in our calibration and that's indicated by the uh, broad bands here. Um, so at this time, we and our goal was to project forward because we knew that the government was planning to reopen uh, in early March. And the question was, what happens if they reopen? And so we looked at this in two ways. One was saying, well, let's just assume that the transmission that we see uh, is due to the, the wild type virus that we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic. And what would we then project? And that's this gray picture. So it would continue to go down, but as a result of reopening, it would then start to rise slowly. But we knew, in fact, we had excellent data on what was going on in the UK where the alpha variant had come in already and had taken off and we knew how fast it was evolving. And when we took that into account, um, and we also knew approximately uh, what proportion of cases were due to alpha in uh, Ontario, when we took that into account, we got this huge spike prediction and we were uh, criticized in social media as for making a rocket ship uh, prediction that seemed ridiculous. And uh, for whatever reasons, uh, the government decided that the trend downwards was what they wanted to focus on, and they did decide to reopen on that date. And then if you look at what happened as a result, uh, the open dots are the actual observed cases after uh, the, when we made these projections, and you can see that, roughly speaking, we got it right. I mean, the, as a result of reopening, there was a huge spike. Then later, um, with more data, we made another forecast um, in mid-March, and at this point, we had a very good idea what was going on, and when you projected forward, we, we were bang on. And finally, after all of that, um, the government did issue a new stay-home order, which then turned things over. So. From our perspective, we were, we were supplying science advice. Um, to us, it seemed like the right thing to do was not to reopen, um, but at least we were able to provide uh, the best science going forward. Now, I just wanna briefly mention though, what happens at the moment, because we no longer have reliable case data. Since the middle of December, uh, the case data has been extremely poor because uh, testing capacity uh, was exceeded. And we've had to fit models to hospital occupancy and ICU occupancy, which we were using previously, but without the case data, these lagged indicators, and it can take several weeks before you end up in hospital, give you a very poor ability to project forward. So this is from the latest science table slide deck, which was published uh, in mid-April. And this is just hospital occupancy observed up to this point. And we really have a very unclear projection. You know, there's a very, very wide uncertainty because we, we really are not able to uh, project reliably. And all we were willing to say was what's at the top here, which is that hospital occupancy will continue to increase, but that the peak, peak will likely to be lower than in wave five. And that's a very weak statement. I think it, it's still potentially a helpful statement, but it's nothing like we were able to do a year ago when we had much higher quality data and we could more quantitatively predict what was gonna happen in the coming weeks. And if you look today at the, at the uh, science table dashboard, you see this picture, which is hospital occupancy. This is the fifth wave. And at the time of our forecast, we were around here. And indeed, um, hospital occupancy has risen as we predicted, but if it had risen to this point or only to this point, our modeling wouldn't have been able to distinguish that because the quality of the data are so low. So again, I'll just emphasize that to do, I think modeling is really valuable for to assist with decision-making, but we can't model well without really good data. So, and I'll actually, I'll close by saying that 
uh, I do work with a group of people at McMaster on uh, all of this. And uh, you can find out a lot more about the work that we're doing at these various places if you're interested. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, David. Um, and now we will move to Baba. Um, and again, same question for you from your perspective, what is something that is critical to consider in pandemic decision-making? Thank you, Les. I, I truly appreciate the opportunity for me to share uh, my work with uh, all of you guys. Um, um, it's very nice that um, Sarah talked about systems and Katie talked about um, the evidence and positions and, and David emphasized the value of data uh, in, in making good positions. As a student of management, I was always interested in uh, how do we make good decisions? Uh, and, and so I'm going to focus on a system that will help us make good decisions. Uh, to put a broad label to what we do, um, we are studying evidence-based management. And evidence-based medicine originated from McMaster. So I'm very much along the lines of uh, evidence-based anything. The purpose of a decision is to improve the status quo, move the entity to a better position, contributing greater effectiveness of the outcomes and greater efficiency to the process. And decisions have time value. And there is always a tension between um, the best or brilliant position and a timely one. Um, the, the purpose of a good decision is to maximally enable us to get to a better place, choose a better option. My old uh, colleague, Henry Minsberg used to say, um, I don't want it good, I want it Tuesday. Um, there, is a, uh, there is much wisdom in that. A decision has to be timely in order for it to be uh, valuable. And the evidence has to be um, timely in order or want to use it to make a decision. A timely decision using the best available information is what we are talking about. Uh, we can talk about many things such as vaccines, mask mandates, school closures, triage, lockdowns, quarantine, border management, and so, so on. One decision will affect many things. Let's take mask mandate. Many things bear on this decision. Why mask? What is the evidence that masks will arrest the spread of virus? What type of masks? Where? Where are they available? What are the distribution channels for masks? How efficacious are these masks with time? How do we convince people to wear masks? What does even a mandate mean? How do we ensure compliance? For how long? And the whole politics of masking. And the decision of a mask mandate has huge implication for mask manufacture, for production planning, for supply chain, uh, mask types, distribution, inventory planning, and these are all global. And we are not even talking about wearers. So the challenge is who's best equipped to make the decision? What is the best evidence for the many questions that surround the decision? Where exactly is the evidence? And oftentimes there are uh, there is evidence that often are in conflict. How reliable is the evidence in each case? How do we access all of this evidence? How do we combine all of them to a, an optimal decision? What is the decision model? How do we communicate the decision? How do we enforce it? Um, and when should we lift the mandate? Why? How? As, as new evidence comes, we saw that uh, from uh, David's slides, uh, we may have to revise decisions without looking as if we are making decisions on the fly. This is the work my team does, evidence-based management. As, uh, as Sarah said, this is a system, a multi-level operation with evidence makers and evidence users. The challenge is 
that we have very little research that directly addresses the pandemic. There is no precedence. This is what we call a wicked problem. Um, lack of clarity of both aims and solutions. And these are subject to real life constraints. So there is no risk-free trials to find a solution. So what we do is gather parenthetical evidence and extrapolate uh, to the situation on hand. The evidence has to be rigorous, it has to be relevant, and it also has to be actionable. And we need to gather these evidence from different perspectives, have some intelligence on how they impact different stakeholders and the temporality of the evidence. No evidence, as I said, unfolds as we speak and questions the previous decision that we have made. Where does evidence come from? It comes in a variety from those who systematically research the phenomena, those who manage the phenomena, and those who experience the phenomena. We need to have a mechanism to curate all the evidence, rank them, combine them, codify them, and make them available in real time for the decision maker so that the best decision is made at every decision point. The point simply I'm trying to make is we need to be able to scout and gather all the evidence. Let's keep in mind, much of the evidence was gathered without the pandemic in mind. And we need to have a team of shifting curators with multiple competencies to sit through this evidence, combine, curate, and codify in a decision-friendly format. We need to have a platform that can receive evidence from different sources in real time, process them efficiently, and make them available to the decision maker in a digestible format at the click of the mouse. So how are we addressing this issue? We are uh, systematic about this. We have a theory of evidence and a model of evidence-based decision making. We have a scale to assess the value of evidence. We are exploring artificial intelligence and machine learning. And we now have a template to codify the evidence for reporting. We've just designed a platform, much like a wiki platform, that receives both scientific and practical evidence a constantly changing team of curators who are also aided by AI and machine learning, a mechanism that could distribute evidence to decision makers, and a technology that ensures trust in that evidence. We are putting it all together. It is still very much a work in progress. i like to thank Jerry and, and his team for the opportunity to share what we do here at the group. Thank you. Thank you, Baba. Lori, I'll have you next. Um, so from your perspective, what is something to, critical to consider in pandemic decision-making? Can you hear me? And you can see my slides? Yep. <laughs> okay, yep. thank you. Um, so Scano Seguego, and in the spirit of indigenous ways of knowing and doing, I'm sharing the critical decision-making considerations by sharing the truths of how we managed the pandemic. So protecting our people at Six Nations of the Grand River. Um, to provide you with some context, our community in the midst of Southern Ontario is still dealing with some, many of the same issues that impact First Nations across Turtle Island. We have inadequate housing, we have, um, um, water issues, we have a complex history, trauma, multiple health conditions, racism, uh, food insecurity, and poverty. And as Haudenosaunee, this is not the first time we've had to endure devastating disease. However, during times of adversity is when our people come together. In the past, we relied on the strength and knowledge of our leaders, our healers, and all of our community members together to survive and recover. We turn to those people to our language and to our culture to, to guide us now. And so this is the experience of a community who has faced hardships together and have found their way through. So very early in uh, the pandemic response, we began monitoring the virus that was led by our Oswegan Public Health. And we established our emergency control group very early on. 
By March of 2020, we were organized to provide community updates to recognize symptoms of the virus. Um, public health outreach was emphasizing hand washing and, and then the pandemic was declared in March 11th, 2020. And as an emergency control group uh, compiled, uh, or com which consists of you know, our, our leadership, uh, we recommended that we do a local declaration of a state of emergency as well. So we came together, we were meeting almost daily at that point um, to really monitor what was happening and to be ready to take care of our community. So we established our incident management team. One of our guiding principles as we came together was this quote, the true strength of a community in the face of adversity is how we protect our elder, elders and our most vulnerable. And that really became our, our guiding principle all the way through in, in, in that project, Protect Our People. So we came together as elected leadership, as emergency control group leaders of the community, um, and we made the decision to close our schools, close our parks and our recreation facilities. We knew that people would struggle financially, so we, we suspended our public works fees and we restricted our Iroquois Lodge, which is our long-term care facility uh, for non, all, all non-essential visitors ahead of the curve of what was happening uh, around us. We established our social media connections, we created a website, and we made the very difficult decision to close the borders of our territory. Um, so we, we really tried to stay ahead of the curve. So on March 27th, 2021, in an unprecedented, unprecedented decision, uh, we actually created um, checkpoints uh, and very limited access to our territory to try and uh, prevent the, the virus from taking hold. We also, um, move to providing supports to our community in terms of emergency housing, um, isolation supports. We did regular, I did a daily podcast for, for weeks. Um, we provide isolation support. So we really, it was truly a multi-sector approach from local um, organizations and, uh, and decision makers. So we, gave, we provided food, laundry, cleaning, transportation, and mental well-being supports. Um, we also, um, provided our community members with opportunities to plant their own gardens and, and get access to food boxes. So um, really looking at how could we be creative in the midst of this. So every year on Victoria Day, we have what we call bread and cheese. And so our leadership came up with a very creative um, decision to deliver this house to house. So we had them all uh, prepared with PPE and packaged our, our bread and cheese, and we were able to bring smiles to our community members' faces. Um, really, that takes a lot of work of people working together. So in terms of making decisions throughout as a, as a First Nations community, we created our own Six Nations COVID-19 pandemic response framework. And again, we did that ahead of the, the provincial uh, response framework. Um, we created decision trees and protocols we were reaching out for funding supports from the Indigenous Services Canada, from Ministry of Health, from Indigenous Affairs Ontario. So it's very complex in a First Nation um, because we have to have uh, partnerships and relationships with uh, federal funders, with provincial funders, um, and with different ministries. Um, and also, uh, we have a really good relationship with uh, Hamilton Public Health and McMaster University, who both, who both came to the table to support us as well. We knew that we had to create higher standards for our community. We had to make sure that we were doing um, what we could because our community is at higher risk. We have multi, multi, multi comorbidity. Uh, we have a, a health status that is, you know, a low, um, more challenged than the general public. And so we enacted um, screening tools and we were always inclusive of in emergency control group and incident management team for any decisions that we were considering. Um, we knew we had to have really strong communication. So we had a, in our incident management team, we had a very talented uh, planning section uh, who were looking at the evidence. They were combing through what was happening. We were connected into epidemiologists at McMaster and, and, and Indigenous Services Canada and really looking at um, what evidence was out there. But the translation that we had to do was to make take that evidence-based information and make it community-based. 
So what of these things that we've learned will work for Six Nations and what do we have to remember? Um, we used our local terminology, so SCODEN, like in a short form for let's go then, and uh, we made that into a community-based um, uh, communication. We created our own assessment center. We created our own vaccination task force. As you see, our vaccination rates remain very low. So the 55% is actually um, still, uh, that's a very current number of our total population that, that's vaccinated. So that also had to um, contribute to our decisions is how do we protect our people? Um, we established our own ma mass vaccination clinic. Um, we really try to encourage our community. And the biggest message I think for making decisions, at least in a First Nation, is working together, having relationships, having collaborative partnerships, um, teamwork, people support, consistent management, commitment to, to keeping and protecting our people and uh, having the unity of the community. So Nyala, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Lori. Well, this was very interesting and I just want to recap a little bit of the highlights that I heard and to give people time to think of questions. We've got one question right now in the Q&A, but I'm sure there are others. So please feel free to write in questions into the Q&A or the chat box. Um, so it was great hearing about basically from the top to the bottom or maybe more from the bottom to the top, how with um, within the pandemic, all these responses that were happening. Um, I've heard a lot about the, the role of evidence, needing timely and accurate and sufficient evidence and how do we ensure that that's happening, um, especially in our environment now where maybe we're not testing, we're not following um, some of the numbers that we used to have. Um, how that evidence is then used by different decision makers, uh, policy makers, community members, how's the evidence presented to people so that they know how to behave and what to do in those situations. Um, I also heard a lot about protecting those who are most vulnerable uh, and being inclusive in our responses all the way from communities. How do you come together to protect people within your community and how do we reach out from there? Um, and what I think of with all of this and some of the work that I've done is, is the role of trust. Trust in government has been one of the major things that, um, you know, has been put forth as being so important uh, for people to know that the message that they're receiving is true, that what government is doing is appropriate and is going to protect people or what to do if they're not. Um, and so a lot of what everybody's been mentioning kind of relates to that same message of trust, trust within community, trust for the evidence, trust for government uh, decision makers. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go over to some questions. Um, so just a comment, Bernie saying great presentations. Thanks to Lori and team for illuminating the indigenous community context. Absolutely, thank you. So I've got um, a question from Sarah um, Allen. Fascinating research, Katie. Uh, did you also explore associations between school closures and policy, COVID policy choices in Ontario and Alberta and other indicators guiding the response such as healthcare worker absenteeism, hospitalizations and ICU capacity? Sorry, should I, I should just um, unmute here. Um, I can I can answer that uh, very briefly. Not yet, but um, it's uh, it's it's on the list. We're particularly interested, though, in the way officials talk about um, their their uh, the sources of of evidence that they use. So it's. That's uh, underway. Yeah. Um, great. And, and I believe in some of that work, Katie, too, there was a mention, was it Alberta that was talking about teaching capacity or 
making decisions based on other factors um, that may have been competing with some of that evidence, right? The case numbers and so on. Um, do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, just, I mean, the we, we did notice kind of an interesting um, pattern in Alberta where um, the, uh, the decisions about school closures were framed as operational issues um, uh, in that, you know, the message was we're not closing schools because schools are risky places for students to be. We're closing schools because we don't have enough teachers because the teachers are out with COVID. Um, so that, I mean, that that is a that is an important distinction, but um, we're kind of interested in the way that was that was used in Alberta. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question from Amy uh, Jill Grass for um, David. Have you attempted to use wastewater COVID data to help model since PCR testing data has decreased so much? Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, we're very aware of the wastewater data. And you can see you can see wastewater data plotted on the Science Table website. We are in the process of trying to incorporate the wastewater signals into our modeling, um, but it doesn't unfortunately take a few days to to think through uh, the best way to do that and to do so reliably. But I'm hoping in the coming weeks, um, we will be able to do substantially better than we're currently doing by exploiting the wastewater, and we're certainly trying to do that. Great, thank you. Um, a couple of questions for Lori. Um, have you had a chance to share these promising and wise practices in emergency management with other communities, public health actors in Ontario and beyond? Um, uh, and then the other question is around um, going back to how First Nations protected their community um, and really enforcing the idea of using the notion that decisions are being made to protect the community, did that create better outcomes for supporting some of the mandates like mask and vaccine mandates? So we do have um, relationships with other First Nations and we do sit at several tables where, you know, the, the, the communities do come together. So we have shared some of those things. I really like that idea of sending in something in writing, you know, some lessons learned and, and we do have, you know, we're constantly monitoring our lessons learned along the way and making recommendations and, you know, um, we're, we're, we've already started revising our pandemic plan, um, you know, based on, on what we've learned already. In terms of protecting our people, um, there was a really uh, strong support for the, the, um, the barricades, that sort of thing. And, you know, community members were saying, I've never felt safer. <laughs> you know, there's, it, it really felt very, very strongly. Um, we had an amazing support for mask mandates. Um, but like you, like you saw, um, we still have uh, about half of our community who just are not interested in being vaccinated. And that relates to historical um, um, maltreatment and by the healthcare system, um, ongoing racism. And it, it comes back to, like you said earlier, uh, issues of trust. So, you know, we've done a lot of community education and, you know, I'll tell two friends and you'll tell two friends and so on. Um, but it really comes back to, you know, this is not just for yourself, but it's for others. Some of the some of the challenges are when we've got people who are, you know, vaccinated um, and who are still getting sick, you know, that that that's sort of used as a as a, a situation. We, we did we did actually have uh, we did lose a number of knowledge holders. Um, to COVID uh, early on in the pandemic, and that was that's that's been very devastating to the community. So you know, I think I think we really you know we just keep spreading that message. So I know in other First Nation communities, much smaller um, communities, they've had you know very high up to 100% vaccination rates. So it, it really does vary across all of our of our of our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and here's a question from Tina, uh, to any of the panelists, but I would actually like, uh, uh, okay, Baba to answer that. So um, 
It's my impression that the public did not always understand or was frustrated with how evidence was constantly changing or sometimes there was contradictory evidence. What is your advice for dealing with this communication challenge? And I would like to actually hear from both Baba and Farah on those. Oh, sorry, uh, Baba, you're muted. Sorry, uh, this is often the challenge of evidence-based management. Um, there are a number of issues that we have to um, uh, align. One is the fact that evidence changes as more research comes in, more data comes in, evidence changes. And we have to reckon with the fact that as evidence changes, decisions will also change. When, when Theresa Tam was changing her decisions during the time of the pandemic, people said, why can she not make up her mind and so on and so forth, I heard all of that. Um, and it is in the very nature of research and evidence that it changes and allows uh, decisions to be made based on the best evidence available at that point in time. And it is a dynamic. We just have to communicate this to the general public. Um, I don't know how, but um, uh, that is why uh, people get frustrated about the seeming shift in the decisions. One day we wear a mask, the other day no masks and so on. But we are guided by the evidence in, in good faith. Thank you. And Farah, from, a, uh, from the community perspective, um, what are your thoughts on that constantly ever-changing communication and new evidence? Uh, well, what Baba says is completely correct in that uh, the nature of evidence is for it to change because as we know more, we can make more informed decisions. However, whether or not the general public has a better understanding of the science of the pandemic, I believe will there has to be a way to get the correct evidence out without social media interrupting it, without um, the news outlets in which they find these evidence, these uh, this data points from, um, how they are skewed can also be a communication challenge. And so what we have to do is try to find ways, although this is a very unanswered question, uh, try to find ways in which the evidence is not skewed and the nature of evidence is portrayed to people as, you know what, it can change. Um, a lot of people are not accepting of the fact that evidence can change because in general, they've been taught one thing and not another. So to change a system of belief as well can be very challenging. Thank you. So I'm cognizant of the time, um, and I know that everybody would like to continue this conversation. Um, so I will leave it with um, one last question that was posed by, by uh, someone listening and also with my own questions. Um, so Daniel asks, um, can the discrepancy between pandemic-related evidence, particularly case counts and pandemic policy, be attributed in part to other forms of evidence, such as mental health related evidence or election related evidence, um, et cetera. Um, so feel free to address that or maybe some of your final thoughts. Um, what have we learned? How do we improve decision making during the next pandemic? Um, maybe Katie, I'll start with you. Give you each about a minute. Yeah, um, I, I think this is, Daniel's question is is a good one and maybe tough to answer in um, in a minute about like how how do we um, shift to different forms of evidence and when is that even appropriate? But I I mean I think um, the final question you know how can we be better prepared for the next pandemic? Um, a, th a thread that runs through the, the research that I'm, I'm doing with my colleagues is asking how well do governments learn from their own past experiences and from the uh, experiences of other jurisdictions. And, you know, we already know the answer is not particularly well in many cases, um, especially when it comes to learning from the past. Um, 
the uh, some of the the reading that I've been doing recently about you know lessons from H1N1 or lessons from SARS is um, frankly a little disheartening. And so I, I I think that an important part of preparing for the next pandemic is a better understanding of barriers to learning. You know, we know we should have learned from past pandemics or previous public health crises, but what lessons from the past did manage to get through and, and which, which were not learned and why were they not learned? Um, and I was, I was really interested in some of Lori's comments about the, the kind of like not waiting for the next pandemic to start learning, but, but to be kind of learning now. Um, and so, um, yeah, I look, I look forward to hearing what, what you, uh, what you have to say about that, Laurie. Yeah, Laurie, go ahead, please. Last thoughts. I think, you know, one of the things that we've learned is, is that we really relied on our relationships, right? Relationships from, uh, with our, political bodies and with our uh, community leaders and with our external partners and listening to each other. And, you know, I, I think it's nothing with nothing about us without us. Um, you know, we say that a lot about and in the indigenous population, but that works for everyone, right? Are we making decisions that are Cons that uh, that have taken everyone's experience and everyone's um, uh, the impacts on all of all of the components of our society um, when we're making decisions and what and and how do we do that in a in a way that is going to um, it isn't equal treatment for everybody maybe right and it goes back to that whole you know what is what is good for this population might not be good for this population but what is what what do they each need and and maybe not um, and, and thinking about things differently I guess um, of of you know implementing um, uh, decisions in a in a in a different way um, collaborative way uh, that's good for everyone yeah thank you Sarah last thoughts yeah last thoughts on how we can do better uh, in the next pandemic well I would say that my takeaway is firstly Canada needs to strengthen um, its social support system and create rights and regulations for the most marginalized uh, and we also need to start right now focusing on socially inclusive, multicultural, multi-abled and anti-racist teachings from a young age so that future voters can grow up and think more inclusively. But most importantly, we have to create communities of care, just as Laurie was talking about uh, when she said nothing about us without us. That's something that the disabled and the disability community also uses very much. So to use these sorts of teachings, whether it's indigenous or disability, that will make every community more resilient. Thank you. David? So I guess I, I would say the, the things I think are most important for the, in preparing for the next pandemic are to think through creation of structures that uh, are in place all the time and can be ramped up rather than having to scramble to uh, you know so to create a science table and a modeling table and to how to uh, you know do testing and and so on so many different things and I think people are thinking very hard about this um, to try and do better in that respect um so that we can react more effectively and quickly uh the next time and uh, there's a lot of discussion going on uh in relation to how to do better at uh, data collection uh ongoing so i'm i hope that we do learn a lot and do get those structures in place and then it will be uh, better for everybody next time thank you and baba Thank you. Um, I go back to um, making evidence available when decisions have to be made. We have to have, and I like the point that David uh, made about having structures. I, I want to have structures and mechanisms that are in place that will help decision makers to sift through and, and, and zero in on the best available evidence in order for 
uh, them to make a good decision at every point in time. I also like Sarah's point, you know, um, we have noticed that um, uh, evidence has been weaponized, decisions have been politicized, and the social media played a role here. And future pandemics, we have to be able to work effectively with the social media in order to move uh, society forward with a, a, a good set of decisions. We also have to communicate that evidence is dynamic. Evidence changes all the time. We have to create that awareness. Great. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank all of our panelists, Hera, Katie, Lori, David, Baba. This was absolutely wonderful. Thank you for making our inaugural um, conversation so wonderful. And I just put in the chat box, please join us for our next Global Nexus Conversations, Friday, May 27th at 12. Um, and Jerry, I will let you have the last few words here. Yeah, very quickly, just again, thank you so much to our master colleagues who have uh, been on this panel. Thank you so much to Clara and Lori for our, co our community partners on the outside for taking your time uh, today to, to share with us this really important uh, information. And, and again, thanks for the to the audience and, and to Liz and her team for putting this together. Uh, and we look forward to more Nexus conversations uh, over the next uh, several months. So thanks everybody and have an absolutely wonderful um, uh, weekend. Take care. <laughs>